It's the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. Green, gardening, and environment radio, flavored with a dash of humor. Welcome to intelligent, irreverent talk about plants and the planet they grow on. Your questions, comments, and participation are always welcome on Facebook and Instagram at The Mike Novak Show and at Mike Now on Twitter. Good planets hard to find. Temperate zones and tropic climes. And true currents and thriving seas. Wind blowing through breathing trees. Strong ozone and safe sunshine. Well, good planets are hard to find. Good planets are in the main. Brought to you by Bartlett Tree Experts. Every tree needs a champion. Go to Bartlett.com. Jet streams, perfect air. And here they are, Peggy Malecki and Mike Nova. Good planets are in the main. Right. Hey, and uh, hello to everybody. Hi. Welcome back, and here we are. Uh, more or are less. Are you outside? Am I? I am outside. I am. Wow. On, okay, this is. Uh, I am on. <laughs> wait, that dinger can do better than that. All right, wait. How about this one? All right. Uh, yeah, I'm, I decided um, in anticipation, and I'm going to be like tweaking the picture here. One of the things I've discovered out here is that. Uh, my uh, lighting, my little ring light that you get that I use indoor is no match for the sun. Uh, and I should have known that, and I, and I kind of did. You can't fool Mother Nature. You cannot. So I brought this out here, and I realized I was completely in silhouette. Um, and for those of you listening on the podcast, I am on my back porch, and this is my garden. I'm going to duck out of the way for a second, and there's, there's the garden. There's the garden. Uh, it's and, green. And I should have put suet in the bird feeder, but it would have been right behind my head anyway. Yeah. Nobody would have seen the uh, the birds. And you've got something the, by your right, to the right of the microphone sticking in front of the camera. Yeah, too. that is the light, okay? Ah, this is okay. part of the, the, the light that is going to allow, I mean, I could cheat like this. There we go. How about there that? There we go. And uh, and then I got a shift, and uh, you know, so this is, I can move, I can try to move some of this. You, you don't know how tight all of this stuff nah, is here on my back it's porch. Fine. Yeah, and it's you can you, you can almost see me. And what I discovered about the ring light is you could see me. Okay, here it is. If I did this, okay. <laughs> oh. Now I if I did this for the whole show, <laughs> you guys could. Have, <laughs> is it worth it? I don't think and so. And to the rest of us, it looks like you've been framed. I, I, I oh, okay, I, I have been framed. <laughs> All right, so uh, that, I'm going to just turn that guy off because uh, there's no point in trying. So you know what? I have to I have to go Hollywood and get all the big reflectors and the big lights if I were going to do this. But what I'm thinking is, because I even went out and bought an, an Ethernet cable that would get Ooh. out this far. Yeah, I got a new one yesterday. Ran out. I got a 50-footer. Now I'm going to need a 100-footer uh, and maybe more um, to uh, so I can set up. I should set up right in the backyard, and then the light will be more even. But and, as you and, and for our listeners who live in new houses, it's the joy of old homes, plaster walls, and routers on the other side of the house. Uh, yeah, well, the, the, the thing is, right, uh, but with this uh, setup with our uh, show and the power it takes to, to get this out there, we need to have uh, Ethernet cable, and it's the, what do they call it, the six. It, there's, it's not the five, it's the six, and I don't even know, you know, those of you who work with Ethernet cables will know what I'm talking about. But uh, it's very bright behind me. Um, it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood, as you know. It's uh, going to be warm. And uh, just as I <laughs> started the, the show, the neighbor's uh, air condition unit c kicked on at the same time. Of course, of course it, they run it when it's 60 degrees. It doesn't matter. It's on okay. every day of the year. And uh, I suppose when it's 40 degrees, it'll kick on too. Mm -hmm. So... Well, and Steve Wenzel says that's a Cat Six cable, by the way. Cat Six, thank, thank you, Steve. Steve. He knows. Thanks. See, we got smart people uh, watching this show, and there's a little 
hovering bee right by that light who just happens to really like that light. So uh, I'm making do. Uh, sometime during the show, I might have to do this because I can't really read what is there. Um, <laughs> Because it, it's it's there's a lot of glare here and uh, and and sometimes when I'm looking at my other computer here I'm just staring right into this light, so right. it's that's the way that works. But hey, uh, everybody! And tribulations. Yeah, we're we're happy to be back. And I'll tell you one thing: taking off for like one week, um, I, f I I was terrified to do this again. It, I feel like I don't remember how to run a show uh, you know i took a, a week off uh and boy i gotta tell you it was nice i don't know if you had as good a time as i did peggy but just uh having some time off was um was lovely it was just absolutely lovely it's that am i supposed to be dialing into something right now yeah exactly oh, no. and but, but but we're getting our welcome backs so like amos is uh welcoming us mm -hmm. back and i'm sorry we messed with uh uh, Alexandra last week because she uh, didn't know what to do without us. Uh, she normally bakes while she's listening and watching the show. Uh, but so, now she says she's fresh in from rat mitigation. I'm not sure. Uh, wow, too much information. And look at, <laughs> I, look, I've got cat hairs on the uh, <laughs> microphone screen hey, here. Hey, Scott. Good morning, Scott Jameson. Just checked in. Oh, I, and I'm glad Scott Jameson checked in. Uh, because uh, in the latter part of the show, uh, we should tell you today we are uh, DeMaio-less today because Rick needed a day off as well. He needed two weeks off. Uh, we get one, Rick gets two. He gets um, two. He's it's the okay. weather dude. He's, he's, he's got a lot of responsibility there. I'm telling you, I don't care. That's it, It's fine with me. Um, and uh, uh, But uh, we uh, have a great segment uh, I I at 10.30 uh, in lieu of Rick DeMaio weather and climate. And actually, I'm going to show you some maps in just a second. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, um, we've got Guy Sternberg from Star Hill Forest Arboretum down in Menard County, Illinois. And, Petersburg, uh, Illinois. Yeah, Petersburg, which is in Menard. And mm, I need to get my throat together here. <laughs> Maybe it's a pollen out here. Maybe that was not such a good idea to come it's on the up. Cat hair. Uh, yeah, I think so. I should not try to remove the cat hair from the the windscreen on my microphone. Um, and he's going to be talking about emerald ash borer and blue ash trees, which he says have a property in them that allow them to survive emerald ash borer a little bit better than other ash trees. There are at least 15 to 25 different North American species of ash tree. I know that because I looked it up yesterday to make sure I knew what I was talking about. I thought it was odd that in this uh, article I saw, I believe from the New York Times, they said there is between 15 and 25. I'm thinking, you guys don't know? You really don't know exactly uh, how many ash tree varieties there are in North America? Well, that's that's kind of interesting. And maybe well, maybe Scott Jameson can tell us about that. Certainly, yeah, and we'll oh, ask Guy about it. We'll ask Guy about it. And I left his book inside. So uh, if Kathleen's uh, listening to this at the beginning of the show, because she's usually running stuff upstairs, uh, she can Set go it to, off with Legata. It's at the, right, Legata's inside too. She doesn't want anything to do with me. Uh, <laughs> get, bring the book down when you have a chance. It's sitting on the coffee table in the, in the living room because I want to uh, hold up Guy's wonderful book of uh, Native Trees for North American Landscapes, which he co-authored in 2004. Um, uh, but it's a terrific book. Anyway, Guy will be talking about that. Uh, at towards the end of the show and Scott we might want your opinions on uh, some of these treatments as well I'm sure you're going to be interested in that before that however uh, we are going to start with Bob Benenson uh, at 9 30 today uh, Peggy and I, and I are going to chat a little bit before then because we're trying to figure out what we're still doing here um, and uh, we've forgotten everything we knew about uh, doing um, a yeah, live, I'm watching live the birds stream behind you, are so. you Behind me or behind you? Behind you. Oh, there are we getting a few there? Yeah. Okay. You know me. I might put that suet out um, at, at sometime during the show. Maybe I'll do it live and let you uh, tap dance oh, no. while I put. <laughs> <laughs> That's just well. <laughs> but I'm only going. You know, I'm only going to get ten thousand sparrows there. There's very one of the things. Oh, live. look. Live. 
on Sunday morning. And sewage installation. As if on cue, look at this. Kathleen brought Guy's book. How cool <laughs> is you, that? Thank you, Kathleen. Huh? And uh, we'll hold it up again later. But it's a, oh, my God, it's a beautiful book. Just a beautiful, beautiful book. So I'll, I'll leave that here. Yeah. No, I, I was just commenting about the uh, live installation of suet in the feeder on Sunday morning radio. Uh, yeah, really. Uh, that's that's about as entertaining as we get on this show, okay? Uh but uh, uh, Guy Benenson is going to be with us at 9.30 to talk about farmer's markets. Uh, everything's Bob Benenson. I'm sorry. Guy Sternberg, Bob Benenson. You know, I just throw names out there. You correct me. Don't forget me Jessica. Uh, no, no, no. Let me get to her. I haven't finished talking about Bob <laughs> Benenson. Jeez Louise. Um, uh, Bob Benenson is going to be here at uh, 9.30 to talk about farmer's markets. And speaking of heating up. Uh, literally and figuratively, because um, we have um, a lot going on this summer. Um, as certainly the weather is hot right now, and um, one of the things uh, that Bob is going to tell us, he's going to give us some survival tips for shopping at a farmer's market when it's this hot, because there are things you should be paying attention to. He's got some... Uh, well, he's got some anecdotal information. You know, he had some... Uh, <laughs> the, the, the peach compote incident. Right, the peach compote incident. He's going to tell us about that. Uh, and we're also going to talk about climate change in farmers' markets. He's got some friends who've gone out and, you know, they're doing it up. They're farming for the first year, uh, mm -hmm. and they're dealing with climate change already. And other people, um, he was talking about one year it rains, we get record rains, and another we yeah. get drought. And... How, how does the farmers trying to grow the same crops yeah. deal with that? Um, and it's that's even at the government level of um, Lauren Underwood proposing climate change funding for farmers right now. So it's getting to be a really big thing. Yeah, uh, and, and they need it. Uh, we all need it, okay? And then, oh gosh, at 10 o'clock, who's going to be here, Peggy? Jessica, Chipkin, Ch and Brody. Uh, from? Crate for USA. There you go. Crate for USA, and we're going to be talking about her efforts to get Aldi. And this is really interesting because uh, Aldi, uh, you know, made some promises, uh, hinted that they were going to do some changes, and then two years down the road, they're like, ah, we've done pretty much all we need to do. Um, no, not really. It's folks. on the suppliers. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, we don't, they, we don't raise the pigs, is what they say. This is what they tell people when people call them and say, hey, how come you're still sourcing? Uh, pigs that have been raised in gestation crates, they say, oh, we don't raise the pigs. We don't have any of those operations. Yeah, we know that already, dudes and dudettes. We get it. We just don't want you to source from those people either because maybe that will go away uh, and, and maybe you can get up to speed with people like Trader Joe's and, and other folks. So mm -hmm. uh, we're going to talk about her trials and tribulations uh, with Crate Free Illinois and trying to get Aldi to pay attention. Um, and I can tell you, you know, I'll say it now and I'll say it again, uh, I'm not walking into an Aldi unless I go in to yell at them about this um, until uh, they get their act together. So we'll, we'll figure out uh, what's going on there, and she'll tell us about uh, what she's been doing. So all that's coming up on the show today, but we have a, <laughs> a laundry list. Oh, and Skeet uh, uh, sent us a, a, a very quick message, Blue Ash. He just writes, Blue Ash. It's a cool tree. Uh, and Amos, yes, no Dr. Rick. I am so sorry. I, you know what? He, 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 he needs to get some time off um, himself. But um, let me, I'm going to my list here. I don't know if you've got, let's see if I can find my list. Oh, we here. were going to talk in part about the Monty and Rose dues. From this week. Yeah, why don't you uh, start that off while I'm looking for my list. So for our listeners who aren't familiar with Monty and Rose, are the Great Lakes um, plovers, the piping plovers that have nested again this year at Montrose, Montrose Beach. Um, they've become quite the local, regional, and international celebrities of uh, an endangered bird that has nested successfully on the Chicago shoreline. They had a nest um, this year, again, three eggs. And it's monitored 24-7 with cameras and cages and everything else. And It's a just skunk. like what the U.S. government yeah. is doing uh, to all of us, yeah. A Monitor skunk still got in this week. 
after the balloon scared Rose off the nest yes. earlier in the week, yeah. um, a skunk got in early in the week and ate all three eggs. And however, 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 that, that's nature. You know, this is the way nature works. Even with a big cage that uh, the stewards there at Montrose Beach Dunes uh, put up, now they're going to put a larger cage. Yeah, because it Mon looks like they're getting ready to nest again. Right. They are, they are pursuing, you know, and that's the way it works. That happened a couple of years ago when the lake levels got too high and they lost a nest. Mm -hmm. They did it over again. Um, so uh, here's to Marty and Rose. Uh, and... Uh, and, and um, related news to that, and I forget which of of the chicks from a prior year, one of the male chicks has been spotted Nish, Nish. Nish in Ohio and looks like will be nesting. Well, and, and they're saying it's that is the first nesting pair in Ohio in umpteen mm -hmm. years. So uh, this is really continues to be a success story. Um, and uh, even even with the the, uh, the bad news this week, you know, and somebody wrote that it was a tragedy. It's not a tragedy. It, it's, it's a setback. Um, and uh, they will nest again, and they will probably lay more eggs, and who knows? We may have new chicks by the end of the summer once yeah. again. You know? And just, a bigger cage. A bigger cage. Skunk, well, I, apparently the skunk just reached through it. Right. You know, the it skunk didn't get, didn't in, get in. in. It didn't right. tunnel. It was just close enough to the side it was able yeah. to get in. So uh, here's Samani and Rose. By the way, um, I'm going to back up a second while we were doing uh, some housekeeping here. Uh, see, I wouldn't have started with Monty and Rose. I would have started about with the show and some... Well, you, you were looking for your paperwork, so I started with uh, Monty yeah, and Rose. Okay, well, don't you have your paperwork, too? I put it at the top. I do, except <laughs> I've got Monty and Rose right at the top. Oh, see, I, I don't have Monty and Rose at the top. In fact, I, I haven't even... I just realized I haven't even opened that email you sent me. Um, okay, um, we are, uh, we've been talking to some of, uh, some marketing friends of ours and, uh, we've been, uh, looking at our, our situation and our numbers here and our live stream event. Um, and we know a lot of you watch us on Facebook, uh, that might be going away, uh, at least the live that we will continue to post, um, our, our, our videos on Facebook, but for a number of reasons, yeah, I, first of all, I'm not a huge fan of Facebook, um, I, I, and uh, I'm not going to speak for you, Peggy, but um, there's just, uh, they, they are, and you've said this, they are in some ways openly hostile to business entities, mm -hmm. on, and they, their algorithms are awful, and um, they, they crunch you down uh, unless mm -hmm. you pay to play. Um, topics get pushed down. Topics yeah. like environmental topics. We're, we're kind of sure that some environmental topics are getting pushed down because they're not important enough. It doesn't sell enough, you know, widgets. Uh, so, And they're also squ squishing people into smaller groups so they can market those groups better. Um, I don't like that. Um, and YouTube has its own faults, but it's better than uh, what Facebook does. So what's probably going to happen in the next few weeks, and so get ready for it. Here's what I would ask folks to do is go subscribe to our YouTube page page because there are going to be two the places. The Mike Novak Show. The Mike Novak Show. Uh, easy the to Mike do. You just, you just click uh, subscribe, uh, and then you'll get notifications when we're going live. Uh, and the only two places you're going to be able to watch it live are going to be on YouTube and on our website. MikeNovak.net, uh, which actually takes you to the YouTube stream, um, and it just—it's going to clear up a lot of things. And it's—we're—we're we're, we're putting our uh, Marty and Rose eggs in uh, the YouTube basket, and hope there are no skunks there, and um, see what happens. Uh, so what we're hoping is that over the next few weeks, uh, more of you subscribe to us on YouTube, and we know a lot of you watch us there already. Uh, we'd love to have more, um, and we think that there's going to be a bigger payoff for us. And and, and, uh, and like it and comment on it. Yeah, that's the other thing. Um, one of the things we've noticed about YouTube is a lot of people will watch something and then forget to hit like. Now, you don't have to hit unlike. That's that's uh, or, or that's you know thumb, thumbs down. They've got thumbs up, thumbs down. Give us a thumbs up while you're there. So uh, we're just giving you a heads up here because that's uh, probably going on. Uh, in the next few weeks, uh, and we didn't want uh, uh, to anybody to be surprised. 
Um, the other thing that's going on, uh, which is really cool, about next week's show, very excited. We, I mentioned this several weeks ago. We're doing a deep dive next week uh, with a couple of environmentalists, uh, movers and shakers in Chicago, Suzanne Malik McKenna, who is the former director of the Department of the Environment or commissioner of the director of the uh, environment, the late great Department of the Environment in the city of Chicago, um, and also uh, Sandra Henry, who was Rahm Emanuel's final sustainability director uh, before he left office. Um, they are both friends of the show. They have both agreed to come on and just talk about where Chicago stands two years into the Lori Lightfoot administration, two years removed from Rahm Emanuel, what needs to be done in terms of envir environmental issues in Chicago. Um, and they're, they, if they don't know about it, nobody does. So I'm very excited to have them both on the show next week. And we're going to go a full hour and a half with them and just have a long chat about this and dig deep. Uh, so send us your questions. Yeah, especially if you live in Chicago, even if you don't. You know, if you don't live in or, Chicago. Or you used to and you escaped. Yeah, exactly. Or if you just want to say, why can't Chicago recycle? Huh? What's that all about? That's just uh, crazy. Uh, we Going back to YouTube for a second. We sure. just thank you. Thank you to um, Tina, Tina Lulu Mac. She says, when you subscribe to the channel, please remember to click on notifications on YouTube. Because you, right. you got to hit the little bell, right? So you know when we're live. So, and, and a lot of YouTubes you'll see, they say subscribe and click on the bell. Now, I don't have that on there because I don't have enough subscribers yet. So when I do that, I'll have that little notification on there, too. But, yes, thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you. And, and as someone else pointed out, you can also watch the show on your smart TV. So you can put that, YouTube on your TV and go make breakfast. That's a really uh, important point uh, is that you can, yeah, I could watch it on my TV, except I'm doing it. So I can't watch yep. it on my TV right now. And you so. can have YouTube on your uh, your device, your phone, <laughs> your iPad, your whatever. Yeah. Um, we, we think it's going to work out well, and we hope you join us in that. Uh, and then uh, join us next week for that uh, show uh, with uh, Suzanne Malik McKenna. Uh, uh, McKenna. Suzanne Malik McKenna, Malik McKenna and Sandra Henry. Uh, we think it's uh, going to be very, very cool. Now, we have a new segment that we're debuting right now. Are you prepared for this? You yes, better prepared be. as I've ever prepared. Okay, <laughs> just want because we even have a little intro and everything. So uh, mm -hmm. Kathleen and I have, have done it up right. So this is our new segment called... <laughs> <laughs> Does this seem like the Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon to have a little segment to intro? I love yeah, that. or or um um uh, Seth Meyers show. Seth Meyers, I got to do it one more time just because <laughs> I'm 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 so entertained by it. <laughs> What I learned this week, I, I, I learned so many different things. It's because I don't know anything to begin with. <laughs> uh, so I thought, you know what? Let's, and, and, and we want our folks watching us right now to join in on this. Send us a note about what you learned this week, a, mm -hmm. a quick one. Um, yeah. And by the way, uh, uh, Tina Lulu says she's a longtime listener from Los Angeles, and we pre appreciate L.A., um, and uh, she thanks you for the shout out, Peggy. Tina and Lulu, uh, you're always welcome to get a shout out. It's a ding. And MD uh, Skeet, our, our buddy Skeet, says, uh, YouTube, been there, seen it, and done it. So simple, Skeet can do it. Well, that's because he, so Skeet, Skeet already jumped over from Facebook to YouTube just, just now. now. Wow. Yep. How cool is that? So, um, uh, what I learned this week. Uh, tell us, what tell, did you learn this week? Well, I learned a lot of things. I learned that if you put um, um, uh, the sunflower suet out in the back, that the downy woodpecker will come and eat it, mm -hmm. but the sparrows won't touch it unless there's nothing else in the yard. 
I don't know what it is about that suet. And it's a kind of a gray color. I thought, wow, that's it's, not that's what they they don't eat it normally. Yeah. It's not their preferred. So for a while it was the downy woodpecker was the only bird out there on it. I mean, and some birds would come and they'd try it and then they would go, eh, and they'd move out. Uh, but that's not actually what I learned this week. I learned uh, from uh, my friend um, MB, Mary Beth, um, who wrote and asked me about pruning some perennials. And she said, we need to do a segment on this. We really should have Tracy DeSabato oust on the program, who's been on my show a couple of times. She wrote the book, The Well-Tended Perennial Garden. Um, and it teaches you how you can prune back your perennials. You can't do it to all of them. For instance, you cut back an iris. <laughs> That's it. You just cut off the bloom for the season. But there are other plants like Monarda and like uh, what, one of the ones she asked me about, Joe Pieweed. She said, mm -hmm. is it time to pinch it back? Because one of the things you can do is you can make the plant shorter. You increase and the iron number. Weed. Iron weed. Uh, I'm going to probably do that with my iron weed this year. You can get iron weed. It'll get to be nine feet tall yeah. if you let it. Otherwise, uh, it gets real bushy and, and four feet tall. Um, and and that works well for small yards. And that's uh, uh, MB has a, a smaller yard. So she asked about Joe Pie weed. Yeah, I pinched mine back last week. Um, and now's a good time. You can do it. Still do it. And you'll still get blooms on your Joe Pie weed. Uh, don't wait too late to do it. Uh, she also asked about um, about uh, turtle head, and so I went to see um, the book. I went into the book, and mm -hmm. um, Tracy DeSabato Wow says you got to do turtle head. You got to pinch it back early in the spring. She said she tried pinching it back in June and didn't get blooms. Yeah. So if you got turtle head, probably let it go for now. And then uh, MB asked about mountain mint. I couldn't find anything in Tracy's book. Uh, my guess is that you can probably cut back mountain mint and have it bloom again. Looking again, at early, though, probably. Yeah. Well, you might be able to get away with it now. I don't know. Uh, I've already pinched back my okay. Monarda, and it looks a lot like Monarda. Yeah, um, Nepotus can be cut back. Um, a lot of plants can be. We and um, we will try to do that segment um, mm -hmm. when we have a chance. So that's what I learned. Oh, and what I told her about the mountain mint is I said, cut back a few stems, see what happens. Yeah. Leave the others so you've got some blooms. Yeah. And then uh, then you'll know. You'll have an answer. Oh, experimenting in on your plants is always a good thing. Uh, yeah. so what'd you learn, Peggy? Um, well, mine's also related somewhat to the suet. Um, I learned that teenage starlings, birds, the, the proverbial murmuration of Teenage starlings are the loudest things in the neighborhood. They're even louder than the house wrens. And they never stop, and they can decimate a suet feeder in about a half an hour. Oh, my gosh. You know, I, I get upset when they go through it in a day because I'm, I'm thinking, hey, listen, it's summer. There's lots of food out there. You're yeah. Now you're just being greedy. But they wiped out a suet? Well, you're cake? looking at six, six juvenile starlings that are very, very hungry. And were they tagging your garage with my the, car your car they tagged your car okay <laughs> and we and we know how they tagged your car <laughs> yes uh, i should have provided a photo no you don't want the photo yeah. it's it, it's quite the view <laughs> wow uh so uh there we go that's what peggy learned and and i'm eager to see what and what i Let's learned see. bruce bruce learned a family of woodchucks are living under his shed in trevor wisconsin um, Amos Barrow learned a small yellow birds attracted to his hummingbird feeder. Oh, and uh, Janine said uh, you can uh, pinch back New York aster as well. Yes, my asters I've already cut back. Uh, in fact, I tried cutting them earlier this year because last year I, I cut them about this time. And that was okay. And I think I cut them too high because then they formed the branches from that point up and they still mm. flopped. So yeah. I cut them much lower in the hope that they'll be bushier. Um, and since they're not going to bloom till September or yeah. October, uh, I'm not too worried about it. So well, what I did with the ironweed last year, I cut some of it back and I left some of it in the back taller. So I had, I had staggered blooms. All right. And we got one more great one, Scott Jameson. And yes, I forgot to mention this when we did this two weeks ago, he says, I learned that it is likely 
the city of Chicago Finance Committee will vote to move forward with the Urban Forestry Advisory Board. Yes. You know what? That's something that Suzanne Malik McKenna will have, and, and Sandra Henry will have a lot to say about, I think, next week. That is such a good idea. Um, oh, and, <laughs> uh, and Alexandra says, I learned not to put raised beds right up against the fence because the alley rats love the loose soil. Again, kill me. <laughs> now, now, it's okay. Go bake something. You'll, you'll feel better again. All right, so that's, that's our segment. <laughs> I just, I love the music. Uh, Where's that screaming marmot? <laughs> uh, oh, I, I, I can find a, a screaming marmot if, if you want, but I think actually we'll bring the screaming marmot in later because we have to take a break so we can get to Bob Benenson from Local Food Forum. You're watching and listening to the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki, and we'll be right back. Whether you're a farmer or a backyard gardener, assist your soil in providing key nutrients to your plants with Spectrum Soil Inoculum from Tinyo Biologicals. The beneficial microorganisms in Spectrum break down and release vital nutrients and make them more accessible to your plants. Spectrum works with nature to decompose organic matter into humus, building richer, healthier soil. Spectrum is approved for use on certified organic crops and is OMRI listed. Get Spectrum at blazing-star.com. time to win our hearts all in let's let the fun begin take a dive take a dive take a dive i see you climbing high i see you climbing high i see you climbing high You have the ability to give your soil a superpower. It's called composting. If you don't have a backyard, you need to contact Collective Resource Compost. CRC has diverted 7,000 tons of food scraps since 2010. They bring you a fresh 5-gallon bucket or a 32-gallon neighbor tote with each pickup. You fill it with organic matter from your kitchen, they swap it out and get it to a commercial composting operation. Fight climate change. Go to collectiveresource.us. And I just want to put in a plug for our friends at DiveHeart.org. What a great organization that is. They sent us this. They, they did this new song, and it's uh, that song you heard, which is 60 seconds of it. It's actually a, a three-minute song. Yeah. Um, and so I said to them, uh, can I take the video and edit it down and create a little commercial or public service announcement and they said yeah of course um yeah and of course now i'll get flagged on youtube for somebody's music but i don't think so um, and dive heart is a local organization working internationally to help people with um various disabilities ptsd etc um with amputees and other uh people and they take them they teach them how to scuba dive and in a lot of cases these people um, have never felt as free in their lives. Um, and it's, it's a way to, to treat people with mental and physical disabilities. Mm -hmm. And it's just such a cool organization. And I'm so proud that we get a chance to promote it. So go to DiveHeart, H-E-A-R-T dot org. Bob, you're looking like uh, you're kind of impress impressed by the whole thing. Um, that is some catchy tune. <laughs> I know. I, I, had the whole rest of the day. I, I noticed you were sort of bouncing uh, to to the tune. Uh, well, welcome mm -hmm. back to the show. It's Bob Benenson from uh, localfoodforum.com. Um, how's it going? I mean, you're only a few months into the mission here. Uh, how's that working out for you? 
Well, I love doing it. This is uh, kind of my dream job to just be able to spend all my time writing about local food, talking to people about local food, connecting with my friends. I've got a very big network in local food since I worked for Family Farm for seven years. And uh, just, um, you know, bouncing around uh, the uh, metropolitan area, going to different farmer's markets every week and uh, seeing Watson season, publishing it. There are so many farmer's markets open right now. Yeah, um, yeah. You, you, and, you And more opening every week. Yeah, for, for at least a couple more weeks, yeah. We, got, uh, we had 29 last week that we added to our list. Wow. And wow. 17 this coming week. And... You know, it's a new newsletter, so I don't really know its space limitations that well yet. And uh, it started getting really challenging, you know, with the presentation that we had. So we're starting to do something new. Today we're, sp we're splitting the list. Today we'll have the outer suburbs and excerpts. Tomorrow, Market Monday, will be Chicago and the inner suburbs. And I've reduced the font. A whole lot. <laughs> <laughs> so it's very, it's, but it, I actually, uh, and uh, you know, it, uh, making making so, some lemonade here, um, it actually looks a lot better. Yeah, it's uh, very streamlined. Uh, everything's on one line for each of the markets, and it takes a lot less time to scroll down to the Saturday and Sunday markets, which is basically when most people yeah. shop anyway. And and kudos to you because you now have. A much longer list than the Chicago Tribune, which came out with only 52 markets last week. <laughs> what, what are you going to do? I do this for a living. They do it once a year. Yeah. <laughs> you know, no, no criticism. I mean, it's uh, it's, it's good that uh, they are providing their readers, and I'm one of them. Uh, you know, with a handy yeah. list of farmers markets, but uh, you know, we we were literally down in the weeds. Yeah, and uh, you've got this. the connections, and everyone's sending them to you. Yeah, yeah, I'm working very closely with the Illinois Farmers Market Association as well. And, uh, you know, because uh, of those space limitations, we only present Chicago metro markets, but I've been linking to Illinois Farmers Market Association, a.k.a. Mm -hmm. ILFMA, um, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Indiana, because what we're trying to do is cover the entire Lake Michigan region, because that's the Chicago food shed. And that's mm -hmm. what feeds into our markets here. So when you go to a Chicago farmer's market, you're not just buying local Chicago. You're buying local Western Michigan and Southern Wisconsin and the rest right. of Illinois and, uh, and Indiana. Well, I don't want to overwhelm you, but how cool would that be if there were one uh, newsletter, one site where you could look up farmer's markets in Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Wisconsin, um, and I know you don't want to kill yourself yet, but um, it, it sounds like you're headed in that direction. Not killing yourself, but actually expanding. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mike. I, I just want a clarification there. Being the clearinghouse <laughs> yeah. for the... Well, yeah. Well, I'll be honest. Um, you know, I left Family Farm on March 31st. I'd already done a few beta issues of the newsletter, and then I launched right into it on April 1st. Uh, but I had already planned for the eventuality that we probably would outgrow a newsletter, and so uh, don't try and buy those local food forum domains out from under me because I already have them. Uh, he's got um, he's got them all. Yeah, and uh, and so I think eventually, at least as a repository for all of these lists and information, yeah. we'll, we'll probably move in that direction fairly soon. But right now, you know, we're trying to provide uh, information as compactly and concisely as we can, uh, while providing links to the other folks who provide the rest of the information. Well, let's, let's give you a chance to promote yourself just a little bit. I mean, we are, but uh, in terms of how people can subscribe and get in on this great information. Yeah, well, Local Food Forum is uh, on the Substack website. So if you uh, Google Local Food Forum, um, you'll uh, uh, find uh, the link to it, and it's localfoodforum slash substack.com. And um, we have free subscriptions, but we also have paid subscriptions. And the paid subscriptions are really very reasonable for a seven-day-a-week publication. If you're really into local food, we're covering the, the gamut. And it's not just we're talking a lot about farmer's markets here, but we have a series called Seasons of Change, in which uh, individual farmers submit a series of stories about what farm life is like across the season. Because, you know, if, you're, if all, all, your only connection the local food is at the farmer's market or the grocery store. You're not getting the whole picture. And farming is never easy. It's very challenging. And you, we really mm -hmm. have to, you know, give uh, our admiration to folks. And we'll, we'll, I, I think we're going to circle back around and talk about uh, farmers and climate change in a little bit. Yeah. But yeah. we're doing that. We're going to be talking to farm-to-table restaurants 
Uh, but we're also going to be talking about the impact of, um, of local food on economic uh, development and growth in our communities, about food access, which is a key issue. It's something that everybody ran into last year during the beginning of uh, the COVID pandemic because there just wasn't enough food in the supermarkets. Supply chain kind of broke down. But there are people who deal with that every day of their lives. So we have to address that. We, uh, you know, uh, um, a diet related disease is a huge problem and it's especially affecting people in under-resourced communities. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, over the past year, people with diabetes, people with hypertension, people with cancer, uh, they were the most vulnerable to getting very sick or dying from COVID. So, you know, we, it, it's just another social justice issue that we need to address. And food often gets overlooked in this context because housing and education and criminal justice, um, uh, you know, they're, they're all key issues and systemic issues that have to be addressed as well. But food is part of the matrix. Yeah, who needs food? I mean, that's, that's, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, by the way, uh, did I get this wrong? Should I have uh, localfoodforum.substack.com? I mean, if we, they go to .com, will it direct them to uh, the Substack site? Um, you know, I'm not exactly sure. Let me make sure I I'm going to. I believe gonna it does. Yeah, I think I, I think it does. Because uh, I want to make because so, I can I can I can correct that if need be uh, while we're on the fly here, but uh, just want to make I'll, sure. I'll, I'll look it up. Uh, Peggy will give us some information uh, right away on that, and uh, we'll because I want to make sure people uh, get involved in the, yep. and and get your newsletter. Yep, it, it 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 does not go to the newsletter. It is it says it's parked free courtesy of GoDaddy. But it doesn't go to the newsletter. Oh, oh, okay. All right. So, so, so it's, lo it's a localfoodforum.substack.com. Well, see now. Here's is, the, is the here, here here's the thing. I can do this substack.com and boom. You're awesome. Look at that <laughs> on the fly, baby. Uh, there is the full um, URL. Thank for, you. Uh, oh thank my you. my thank pleasure. You. But I want to make. I don't want to send people to the wrong place and then they. Uh, they they can't find it and they get upset. So, um, yeah. all right. One of the things that uh, two things before we get to the the heat tips, the survival tips mm -hmm. for shopping at a farmer's market in heat. Um, I was reading some of the stuff you you posted and reading other things. Um, and it's a new year, and uh, one of the things that is great is that we have this explosion of farmers markets. Um, but some people are saying that. People right now in June are not as desperate to buy food at a farmer's market as they were a year ago. Uh, what was so odd and interesting and uh, encouraging about 2020 was that uh, folks didn't go to the supermarkets because they were afraid to, but they were happy to go outdoors. And that was a big surprise because farmer's markets didn't know whether they were going to live or die. And then suddenly they boomed. Now, a year later... Oh well, it's old news. Uh, we can go back into the supermarket. Is so? Uh, are we going to see declining numbers? Uh, and is that a sort yeah, of peak, peak farmers market? You know, um, it's all anecdotal. You know, I, I haven't seen any numbers, but all the farmers market managers I talk to are very happy with the numbers that, that they're receiving. Um, you know, people get into habits, and they also remember who was there for them when they really needed. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, when they were in a real pinch. Um, you know, I, getting people to the farmer's markets in the first place was always the biggest challenge because there were so many other easy, convenient ways <laughs> to get food. But once, um, you know, they started going, I, I often call, you know, uh, uh, farmer's markets the starter drug for the good food movement because uh, you're tasting this food. It's just been picked yesterday. It's so fresh. It hasn't traveled thousands of miles. It hasn't sat in warehouses for weeks. I'm not saying that people shouldn't shop for, you know, healthy food in the supermarkets. Of course they should. But uh, once you taste that perfectly fresh food, you know, ripe fruit, perfectly uh, on, on time uh, other, uh, vegetables and other produce, you're tasting it like most of us have never tasted it in our lives. We all grew up going to the supermarkets. And, of course, there's this old joke about generations um, uh, believing that food grows shrink-wrapped in the supermarket. So um, it's also an experience. It's an outing. Um, it's a community feeling. 
And, um, and you know, I'm, I, I've been to a number of farmers markets myself, and, you know, it's not like people are staying away. No, they're, they're, they're still turning out uh, in at least as good numbers as they were a couple of years ago, and probably better. I mean, there are lines at some of the stands now, and, you, and it's not like last year where everybody had to be six feet apart and, uh, you know, and, uh, and be served by the people at the stands. CSAs, Community Supported Agriculture Subscriptions, we're almost going out of business a few years yeah. ago. That's where the real weak link was. And in like 2017, 2018, it, yeah, the convenience factor was a problem. You had to either go to the farm or go to a drop site, um, and not that many CSAs were do doing home deliveries. Um, last year, a lot of the, uh, the farms raised their game in terms of home delivery or created uh, additional, more convenient drop sites. Mm -hmm. And everybody's selling out, and everybody is selling out this year, too. So, again, there's another positive sign that um, people aren't just going to go back to the old normal. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, it, yeah, go ahead, Peg. I was going to say, and some of it, like you were saying, is the taste. They yeah. know taste is this is different than what I ever got in the supermarket. Why go back? Yeah, absolutely. Taste is a big factor, but the other things that are going on now is we just come out of the worst health crisis in a century, you mm -hmm. know, and then it's something that uh, almost, you know, the tiny fraction of the population had ever experienced, and they experienced it as children, you know, or centenarians. And um, the uh, concerns about health and food, food and wellness, transparency, where is your food coming from? How is it being grown? Is it being grown sustainably? You know, it's, it's, what's its impact on the environment? Uh, and again, these questions about food security that arose for the first time in most people's lives last year mm -hmm. uh, are still present, and they're still going to be mm -hmm. present for a long time. So I, I feel like this is a seize the day opportunity for those of us in the local food movement. It's one of the, re the re reasons that I was motivated to create this newsletter. Uh, you know, three years ago when people were kind of going, so what about local? And not, uh, you know, and, and dropping their CSA subscriptions might not have been the right time to do it. But right yeah. now, I think there is a considerable interest and um, in, in just buying local in general yeah. and in food in particular. So we won't know until there are, as you say, hard data uh, on this, whether this is a paradigm shift or it, something else is going on. But I would hope that at least for a few years, people remember what it was like to be Afraid to even, I mean, remember the early days of the pandemic? We're talking oh. about washing vegetables with soap because um, uh, you, you should Letting be everything sit for two or three days. And, yeah. it's, and, and of course, what we realized is that was nuts because that's not how the disease is spread. So um, uh, now uh, we're in a different situation, but I'm hoping that it, People remember those lessons, and they stick with this. And, and as you said, they like to reward their friends who provided them with yeah. good, healthy food a year ago. And I think that's, that's a good uh, uh, yeah. an indicator that people might stick around. Yeah, I think it is. And, uh, and uh, um, you know, we're, we don't know exactly what the new normal is going to be. But it's, uh, you know, you don't, don't go, go through experiences like the ones we just had for the last 15 yeah. months without things, uh, things changing. And if people become accustomed and, uh, and decide there's a better way, and they reprioritize. You know, yeah. when the economy is booming and uh, everything's going well and everybody's more concerned about, you know, where they're going out, you know, to have fun that day or that night. Um, you know, the, the, going to a farmer's market might not have been a, a, as high a priority. But now mm -hmm. we've been through all this and um, people are as concerned about what they put in their bodies as what they put on their bodies in terms of clothing and shoes and things like that, or what they put their body in, like cars and houses. So, you know, I, I, I think that uh, the, the, this, is, this is a paradigm shift where a lot of people are yeah. going to say, yes, uh, I can afford, you know, a box of organic blueberries, you know, if I'm bragging yeah. about my closet full of shoes, you know. <laughs> and I think people have also realized as they're going out to the markets and as more vendors are getting involved that it's not just the box of blueberries or the, the bag of kale, right. that it is it's it is natural body care products, it is soaps, it is mm -hmm. herbs, spices, yep. teas, o oils, all these other natural products that now, because the markets are growing, you're pulling in more vendors at this yeah. point. Yeah, and you know... 
And, you know, the other part of this is, and this is another evolution from, uh, from the pandemic, a lot of farmers, they didn't even know the farmer's markets would open at all last year. Right. And they already planted or started planting their crops. And the shutdowns came in March 2020. A lot of them pivoted very quickly. And some of the markets, like Green City Market, uh, uh, pivoted very quickly, go online with delivery services. Yeah. So there's Virtual a huge markets. convenience factor. Yeah, there's a huge convenience factor that wasn't there, you know, 15 months ago. And a lot of and there are a lot of farmers doing their own e-commerce and their own home yeah. delivery. So um, the fact that the markets are still this this crowded at a time that people have even other options to shop for local food is is mm -hmm. also a, a, a promising uh, development. Yeah. All right. Now we need to get to the uh, what you say uh, and I, I wrote in the blog is uh, called the instant peach compote incident. What is that all about, Bob? Yeah, Tell us, Dr. Bob. I, 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 I tend to learn from my mistakes, and I make a lot of them. And one of them was about 20 years ago. I, we lived in uh, Washington, D.C. for 30 years until 10 years ago when we moved here. And, uh, you know, to say hot summer day is redundant in Washington. <laughs> it's a hot summer day from, like, May to November. And... Um, I went to a farmer's market. I, I frequented the DuPont Circle Farmer's Market in D.C. And it was a very hot day. I didn't go early. So the stuff had been sitting outside in the sun for quite a while. So if it showed up ripe, it was like super ripe. Um, I got a bag full of beautiful peaches, plastic, you know, a plastic bag. Got to my car, which had turned into an oven, as cars do when they're sitting outside in, uh, in, uh, in summer heat. So I put the peaches in the backseat of the car. I blasted the air conditioning. I drove home four miles, probably took me about 15 minutes, reached into the backseat and had a bag full of cooked peaches. <laughs> they had absolutely completely broken down. They were in a hot puddle. They were absolutely useless. I suppose I could have figured out why they would pour them into, into a bag and made a smoothie, but it, it seemed like, like, a lot of, <laughs> like a lot of trouble. So um, that's when I learned uh, a few literally hot tips uh, for uh, shopping at, at the farmer's market during, um, uh, during a heat wave. And first, uh, the best thing is to go early. Um, you know, the, the farmer's markets all have tents these days. Um, they keep the product as much shade as they possibly can. But heat is never, uh, you mm -hmm. know, high heat is never a good friend to, um, uh, to fresh uh, vegetables and produce. So go early. Uh, you'll get the, uh, the, the, the best pick um, of everything that's out there anyway. It's a good rule at, at, at any time. Um, bring an insulated bag. Or if you have gotten any delivery from, you know, Whole Foods and you, they, you order some meat or other perishables, they put them in those silvery insulated bags. Bring that. That will give, uh, uh, enable the, uh, the product to stay cool inside the bag while, while it's hot out. Uh, um, then, it, you know, if you're planning on uh, uh, taking a long walk home or a long bike ride home or like I did, put the stuff in a really hot car, also bring cold packs. Yeah, you, almost everybody has them in their freezer. And um, that will enable you to really be ensured that things stay, uh, stay cold. If you bring an insulated bag and the cold packs, you get an A+. Plus. And you're absolutely guaranteed. <laughs> bringing, but the, there's there's another idea here. If you're if you're an omnivore, and uh, most of us are, even though we're all uh, eating uh, more plant based diets, so most people still eat uh, some sort of meat. And um, in Chicago, Cook County, and most jurisdictions in this region, uh, farmers market uh, meat vendors have, have to sell their product frozen for safety reasons. So buy yourself a nice roast. Stick that in with the produce, and it's going to stay cold. So, and you also have something nice to put on your pressure points. So if you get too hot, <laughs> you, know, uh, the, you can cool off that way. These are great tips. And one of the things I'm going to do is because uh, Sitka Salmon Shares was a, uh, a sponsor on the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. Uh, they bring their uh, product in these wonderful insulated bags. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and I... And during the pandemic, they weren't taking them back, and I need to get them back to them. I'm not going to hold on to them forever, but they uh, you put a couple of those ice packs in there in an insulated bag, 
and uh, mm -hmm. boy, it just keeps things really cool for a long time. So, and you know, it's just a little, a little bit of planning. J don't just dash off, especially if it's 1 p.m. Yep. That's probably not mm -hmm. the best time to run out of the house without. And, and don't put your fresh lettuce right next to the ice pack in the bag. <laughs> no, that's, that, that, that is also true. And you know, another little tip, and if you look at yesterday's uh, newsletter, you'll, you'll see a, a photo that I took uh, of the frozen roast, the, I, the, uh, the cheese and the strawberries. Oh yeah, the little um, bowl. Yeah, um, if you're buying uh, delicate fruit or other, other items that, that, that can be damaged, bruised on the way home, bring a container with you. You know, they'll, they'll, if they just throw it in a, in a plastic bag or even put it in those little paper containers in a plastic bag, they spill. If, you, uh, if you're not careful, then set something on top of them. You'll wind up with a lot of ruined um, uh, product uh, by the time you get home. Just bring a bowl or, uh, you know, a deli uh, container and, uh, and pour your uh, purchases in there. And again, you're guaranteed of coming home with exactly what you expect when you uh, buy it at the market. Okay, we've got about four minutes here, so I want to get very quickly... Uh, to your friend uh, from Wild Trillium Farm in Richmond, Illinois, Christine Johnson. She's been writing for you, uh, and she writes about climate change and growing things. Tell us a little bit about her story. Yeah, uh, they, uh, Christine actually wrote the first season of Change Story for, uh, for Local Food Forum, and she's written, written uh, three more, including one that we published on Wednesday. And her la latest piece is very important and it's very poignant because uh, she and her two uh, uh, partners in the in the business, Katie Zemanski and Emmy May, are all beginning farmers. They've done urban growing before, but this is the first time growing on a rural farm. And so, you know, if it's challenging for veteran farmers, and it always is, it's really challenging for beginners learning how to deal with the vagaries of farming. Climate change mm -hmm. has raised the ante for everybody over the last few years. You, uh, we just do not know from one year to the next, what the weather is going to be. The regular rhythms that farmers had for decades, centuries, are, it's, it's not the case anymore. This year, spring has basically been about 5% spring, 60% May, and 35% July. It's been either too cold or too hot. There have been freezes followed by heat waves, followed by more frost mm -hmm. and, and all this. Pretty has dry. Been very, very, very dry in most areas too. Uh, and so uh, her, um, uh, uh, Christine is a very thoughtful person. She's a Young Farmers Coalition activist and um, uh, is, is an environmentalist. And so her uh, um, piece was just about how farmers have to prepare for everything. Uh, they have to prepare for all these vagaries because we just don't know what we're gonna get. You, uh, you know, it's been very dry in Northern Illinois but people tell me in central Illinois, they had some flooding rains for a while, and now it's gotten dry. Yeah. And uh, you can find this piece um, at, uh, at the local food forum dot substack, substack. Dot dot com. com. And the Thank title you. is Wild Trillium Farm Farming's, Cl uh, Farming's Challenging Climate. Um, and uh, that's a, another thing. Obviously, you I can go to the web. I just put the link up in, uh, in the feed, too, here. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, and 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 I've got something for uh, for for both of you because Peggy asked about it earlier. And this is what happens if you go out to a farmer's market on a ninety degree day and you forget to bring uh, an extra bag. Ah! <laughs> 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 that that was pretty much my uh, my uh, uh, no! what I did when I saw those $20 peaches. peaches. Yeah. <laughs> the, yeah, the peaches. Oh, oh my goodness! I I know that's. I, I, I was going to say, I also put another link up in the feed, um, and I know we don't have time to talk about it today. The uh, proposed new proposal in Congress of uh, climate change related funds for farmers. So I put that feed up if anybody wants to follow that. Yeah, let's, let's make a mental note to talk about that uh, uh, ne next time because that is, it's crucial. Yeah. And, and the Biden administration's USDA is making a lot of positive moves uh, in the direction of raising the emphasis on local food. I mean, it's been all about big food and big ag for so many years with the federal government, and they are doing some, some interesting things that could have real impact down the line. Well, Bob ben Benenson, uh, this is fantastic. I, I, I'm still amazed that you can put out something every day. Um, uh, again, you know, at, this was after spending. Uh, I, we've been talking uh, on this end about how 
how I can keep from spending eight hours writing a blog post. Well, yesterday it only took me six hours, so I'm thinking that's that that was a a, a victory of some sort. Yeah, you know, I I, I end up like the screaming marmot uh, a little bit, but uh, you're doing some amazing work right now, and I hope folks uh, go to localfoodforum.substack.com and they uh, sign up uh, and you know get a taste of it. You can get a taste of it for free, and if you like what you see, then get a subscription. Uh, um, and it's not very much, is it? No, it's only fifty dollars a year, five dollars a month. Um, uh, you know, five dollars a month is you know five dollars a day is what a lot of people spend for uh, for coffee. So exactly, um, yeah. Think of, think of it as if if you're if you're one of those spending five bucks, usually like five fifty, at a Starbucks. Uh, or some other place to, to get your coffee. Uh, it could be spent, you know, take yeah. a day off or take every other day off from there and, and, yeah. and get local food and for them. Help, help support Bob, support local food. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your support, and I hope that uh, 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 some of your uh, uh, viewers will uh, check it out and be inspired to subscribe. It's fun. Oh, it, that's yeah. The thing. That's, what I, that's what I want to emphasize. You know, we talk about serious issues. We provide a ton of information, but I try and keep it entertaining and fun with their trivia questions <laughs> and lots and lots and lots of photos, which I take myself. Well, next time yeah. uh, you're on the show, we'll have to include you in the What I Learned This Week segment, uh, and you can tell That'd us. That would be awesome. Yeah, okay. Uh, Bob Benison, thank you so much. Uh, he's, he's, he's becoming a semi-regular here here on the program so we'll probably see you in the next few weeks and you can tell us how uh, how the summer is going yeah maybe we could do uh, good food local food fourth of july tips ah that i think i think you've hit it right there all right oh, fantastic good. all <laughs> right bob. Uh, okay good we're coming back with have jess a... jess uh yes yes bob sorry uh, i was just gonna say have a great rest of the show Bye -bye. Oh, uh, we're going to do our best. All right. And speaking of that, we've got Jessica Chipkin from uh, Crate Free Illinois coming up next. Hi, I'm Vic Nakashima with Bartlett Tree Experts. You know, there's nothing quite like a walk in the woods. The sights, the sounds, even the smells. But when's the last time you stopped to consider what was going on under your feet? the forest floor. It has fertile soil that is packed with nutrients and beneficials, providing for all these trees exactly what is needed to grow and thrive. But what about your yard? Chances are your lawn doesn't look quite like this. And it might surprise you to learn that most landscapes and yards have unfavorable growing conditions. So it begs the question, what do your trees and your shrubs need from your soil? And are they getting it? Not sure? Not to worry, we know how to find the answer and the solution. Bartlett Tree Experts has the most intensive soil care program in the industry. And it starts with us sending a sample of your soil to our laboratory, which analyzes over 15,000 soil samples a year. Once we know the condition of your soil, we can accurately prescribe a customized soil care and fertilization program tailored specifically to meet the needs of your trees and shrubs. Nutrients and amendments can be custom blended on site and delivered directly to your tree's root zone, avoiding any competition from turf roots. Proper care for soil can help your trees become greener and more vibrant. They'll be stronger, better able to withstand extreme weather conditions or attacks from pests and disease. Nothing is more critical to your tree's health than good soil. So, whatever your trees need, we will work with you to improve growing conditions and help your landscape thrive. Welcome to the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. Green, gardening, and environment radio with just a sipson of humor. Or is that a dash? Brought to you by Bartlett Tree Experts. Every tree needs a champion. Go to Bartlett.com. Here they are again, Peggy Malecki and Mike Novak. All I need is good food to eat and make me healthy, wealthy, wide awake. Lettuce, tomatoes, root, and bacon. What about those sweet potatoes? All I need is good food to eat. All I need is good food to eat. All I need is good tools to make me music, porches, lawn serene. And welcome Here back we to the show. And I was uh, watching in queue there as Jessica was uh, 
uh, trying. You had Brody there, and uh, yeah, where, did Brody Brody Brody? where did Brody go? He flew away. She'll be back. You can she'll be back. Will Will she? Okay, because Brody. Yeah, be, I need to have Brody as part here. of this conversation. Yeah, I know. I know. She'll be back. I had her. I had her in my hands, and then I was saying, "Come on, come on, let's get on." So I could introduce her, but she flew away. She'll be back. <laughs> okay. Uh, before we uh, we get to this, I got to show you something that. Uh, uh, Let's see if I, I've got a I've got the photo here. This is uh, the setup uh, at uh, Shea uh, Novak uh, Thompson. Even as we speak, Kathleen came by earlier, and uh, that's the, that's what it looks like uh, on the back porch uh, doing the uh, live uh, live stream here. And that's what it looks like with the uh, the the fake lights there that we've got and. Uh, they're they're just uh, LEDs that uh, <laughs> we we put so we can just see my face a, a little bit. So there you go. Yeah, it's very you. It's very you, Mike. It's very you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and Brody approves. Uh, yeah, she does. Uh, what kind of bird is Brody? Brody is uh, called a Quaker parrot. That's kind of the vernacular name. There's a very long um, scientific name, but they call them Quaker parrots because when they're happy, they they kind of quake like that, so they just call Quaker parrots. Wow. They're not really the, the, the parrot they're, dance. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and before we went to break, I, I I'm not sure if I said crate free Illinois or crate free USA. I might have said Illinois because I'm so you used said to Illinois. it. Illinois. I did. Yeah, yeah. I figured I, I did. Didn't even notice actually. <laughs> uh, I didn't so notice. so kudos, crate free Illinois has recently rebranded as crate free USA and extended, right? Yeah. The reason that we did that is that. We're based here and we have a lot of focus here. And obviously, Illinois is the kind of state that has a lot of problems because we're the fourth largest pork producing state and the number of factory farms is growing in our state. So obviously, there's a focus here. But in recent years, we've gotten very involved with retail campaigns and trying to get retailers to require their suppliers, their pork suppliers, to commit to higher animal welfare standards. And these changes are national of na in nature. And although Aldi is, and we'll be talking about Aldi, although Aldi is based right here in Illinois, in Chicagoland, they have stores all over the country. So people have said, well, are you just talking about stores in Illinois? And our Costco campaign, are you just talking about Costco's in Illinois? So it really made sense to, because these are national campaigns to do that. <laughs> and of course, Brody wants in on it now, now that we've gotten to the yeah. serious part. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Busy, but Mike. She's yeah, busy. Yeah, she's. That's, uh, but uh, that makes you're right. That makes a lot of sense because you are working with national chains and trying mm -hmm. to get them to change their behavior. And you were successful a couple of years ago with Trader Joe's. Uh, largely successful. I mean, not every pork product, but most of their pork products now. If you go into a Trader Joe's store and you go to the fresh pork, it will say like uh, it will say. Um, just say uh, no crates ever or something like that. No, uh, no crates crate or crate free. I mean, it's, it's something like that. I haven't looked at the label recently. Although every time I do go into Trader Joe's, I kind of look to see, okay, is that one still say that? Because I know like a lot of companies during the height of their pandemic, they did have some supplier issues. And one of the products that was crate free, no longer says crate free, but we've been in touch with them and they said they're reworking that supply chain. So. At least with Trader Joe's, I mean, they do respond and they have been attentive. So she's singing Jingle Bells right now. I <laughs> can I can I get her to join my uh, caroling group? Uh, uh, that would be uh, that just would be great. except the weather might be cold for her. They are um, basically um, exotic birds, so right. I keep the house warm. So. Well, I would give her a muffler. <laughs> What? The frozen robins plus one. There we go. Exactly. Right. So. Right. <laughs> Um, you know, and, and, and it's good that we can laugh about this, um, you know, uh, find some humor in, because what, what you're doing is really very serious. Uh, when I posted the other day that you were going to be on the show, um, I had a listener, a, a person I respect very, very much who said, uh, there's no such thing as humane treatment to animals that get slaughtered. Okay. Yeah. Right. And, I saw it and, um, I don't want to interrupt you. So no, no, no. But tell us your, your response to that. I saw that, and um, first, I, I want to go on record saying um, I am a 
a vegan and I don't consume animal products, so I get where that person is coming from. But these are these are very incremental changes in the lives of animals raised on industrial farms, the kind of suppliers like Tyson and JBS and Smithfield. These are so these are very, very incremental changes. And of course, this, what happens in a slaughterhouse is a whole other story. And um, but this and not and I'm not minimizing that on any level, but that the kind of change that we're asking with getting these pigs, these mother pigs out of gestation crates is just a very first step in giving them a little bit more of an opportunity to express some kind of natural behavior in their really, I can't, I won't cross on the show, but really crappy lives. And, um, and, and even that is so difficult. So, I mean, just for some perspective on that comment, because in my heart, I really agree with that person, but the mission of Cray Free USA um, is really just to make the lives of these animals that are already stuck on these factory farms a little bit better. We can't forget about them. I mean, I, you know, again, like if, if everyone stopped eating meat or really reduced meat consumption, these problems would go away. But the reality is a lot of people are still shopping at the big at stores at major grocers to buy pork. So that's where we're focused in the supply chain. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, no, it, it absolutely does. And one of the things I put in my blog post uh, that you say on your website, uh, there is something seriously wrong with the food system where the best day of an animal's life is the day that life is taken. Our purpose is to change this through consumer education, activism, and by supporting farmers who treat animals and the environment with respect. Uh, right, the kind that Bob Benenson was always talking about. She just said, excuse me. <laughs> excuse me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay. Um, <laughs> then I lost my train of thought. Uh, uh, Bob Benison. Yeah, right. And that 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 saying that you just said, uh, the animal's best day of the li life is the day said, I got that from you. When you hosted our event a few years ago about the mm -hmm. Illinois Ag Council, um, you said that, and I wrote that down, and I plagiarized you on that. I've been using that constantly. That is one of the best quotes because that's exactly – that's exactly right. But going back to that comment that follower of yours said about the slaughter chain, that's, you know, it's really not the day, the last day of their life is the day they have to face the slaughterhouse. So it's actually when they're dead, you know? So, um, but no, I mean, that's really, and you know, another a bit of perspective for the listeners out there is that the changes that we're asking of Waldi and other big suppliers that do that rely on these major suppliers, um, we're not asking that these mother pigs um, go outside or see sunshine or get to like put their or get to like you know play around in mud. We're simply asking that they have room to stretch their legs or turn around. So just think about that. We're not. It's so impossible to get Aldi to even consider doing that. Again, we're not saying Aldi change your supply chain and only go to sustainable local farmers. We're just saying, give these animals the opportunity to stretch their legs. I mean, it's, and we can't even get anywhere with that. It seems so, I don't know, it just seems. Well, I, as you say. I, I was gonna ask. Kind of thing. Go ahead, Peggy. I was gonna say to back up for our listeners who might not be familiar with the Aldi story. Well, let's back up even further and, and, and something from the website that, again, I put on my blog. You can go to MikeNovak.net to read about this. The sow's entire life consists of impregnation, confinement in a crate so small she can't turn around, giving birth to unnaturally large litters in another tiny crate, and final separation from her babies in about two weeks, impregnation again. And that's the life of these sows uh, and this is this is inhumane and you're asking uh, aldi and some of the other companies that you're working with stop that practice i mean at least stop that practice right right exactly and you know what's interesting is just to backtrack we, we started this campaign with aldi this summer is exactly two years and when we first we started with a change.org petition which is a great way to get um, initial um, engagement 
And right now, I think we're one of the highest performing institutions on change. We're closing in on 400,000 supporters. And um, uh, and when we first started, and we start, I started to get some local press. Aldi's um, at that time they had a lot of change of staff last year. But at that time, Aldi's um, director of corporate social responsibility reached out to me as soon as an ad broke, as soon as an article broke in a local paper, um, and to come meet with them. So I brought Josh Bulk, who's VP of Farm Animal Protection, with me to the meeting at Aldi. And at that time, Aldi didn't have any statement about gestation care specifically on their website, their animal welfare policy on their website. Um, so shortly after the meeting, they informed me that they added a bullet to their online animal welfare policy that says, we expect, and that's the key word here, expect our suppliers to transition away from gestation grade crates to group housing. And that was pretty much it. So this was a very tiny step forward. We were excited at the time, but really two years have passed now. And the word expect kind of uh, is a, it's kind of misleading and what that actually means. Like I'll give you an expectation can go on in perpetuity. Like every New Year's, I tell my friends and my family, I expect to lose 20 pounds by June. And I've been saying that for the past 10 years. It just doesn't happen, but I'm, maybe it will this year. I expect it to happen. Year. but it's true but anyway so um so and that's so an expectation like i said can go on in perpetuity and it really becomes yeah, so there's no enforcement method. method in it right and what we're asking all the is to do the same thing its competitors have done um, tr um costco kroger target have all now there's issues within that but they've all committed to end the use to require their suppliers to acquire that's the word they made a commitment to end this practice by 2022. Now, there's some issues within that, um, which is another story, but still they've gone on record making that requirement and Waldy won't even go that far. And not only that, but they just have like turned off to um, any type of meaningful, thoughtful dialogue. I mean, um, for instance, if you post something, uh, something very politely on their Facebook page, just mentioning the word gestation crate, just a crate free pork, it will be immediately removed. Um, I mean, my I did it. Okay. Um, we were talking about this a few weeks ago, and Jessica said, Yeah, see what happens. And so I said, Okay. And I very politely said, Hi, love your products. Um, we're, are you going to consider uh, not, not sourcing from uh, farms that use gestation crates? That post, that comment was gone within two minutes. Two minutes, they're they 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 are ready. They pounce on those things. And they don't want to hear wow. it. They don't want to be reminded of this at all. So this is right. uh, not good. And I don't know if there are other key phrases. And I deliberately use gestation crate. No, it's just gestation crates or crate free pork. If you say cage free eggs, that will stay up there. Mm -hmm. Really? So there are other things you've tried that will stay up, like uh, 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 if you criticize something in their store, it, it will stay up there, but as yeah, long as... Yeah, I, mean, I, I actually, they don't respond to emails. Excuse me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> getting some back talk there. What's I going to say? This happens all the time. On my Zoom calls with clients, too. Uh, about them responding to Facebook and emails. We, we were talking about all the responding <laughs> to Facebook no, and email. Now, now we're listening to Brody here. It's, okay. Okay. Um, I, sorry. I lost my train. Um, <laughs> Jessica, we were talking about Facebooks and emails and Aldi and, and right. They don't respond to emails either. And I actually cut and pasted comments on their Facebook page that actually stays. Like one person saying, like, um, you know, berating them about their mask policy or their dog food smelled so bad it made made their dog sick, things like that. And they're going to, like, take it up with their lawyer. I mean, that stays. But they don't read emails. Um, you know, it's, it's all very, very disappointing. Um, in, a, in a company that, you know, in a company that really, you know, is very well respected and fast growing, it's the fastest growing grocery store chain, but they just decided they do not. I mean, the fact that they continue to allow this practice 
in my mind means that they they it's okay with them. Um, and I just want to talk about something else very brief, briefly because I think Aldi understands that people really care about this issue. Mm -hmm. So one thing, Mike, I didn't mention to you that I want to bring up that demonstrates that Aldi understands that people care about animal welfare. Um, in the past, in the past nine months or so, a new should I? That's okay. I don't know what that was, but we're we're cool. Oh, okay. Um, Last year, a new label started to appear on their chicken products called yeah. One Health Certified. Um, and if you look look at the label, it looks very green and healthy. And on it, it I says- I just posted the link to that, by the way, for our, our yeah, viewers. Yeah, it says responsible animal care. Well, that, that label is the product of a factory farm called Mountaineer. It's one of the largest chicken factory farms. And that label, I'm looking at my notes, has been shot down by a diverse coalition of more than 50 environmental, public health, and animal advocacy organizations, including the Center for Food Safety, National Resource Defense Council, John Hopkins Center for a Livable Future, um, Antibiotic Resistant Act, anyway, on and on and on. And they say, quote, the latest example of humane washing, it's misleading packages that steers consumers to incorrectly mm -hmm. believe that animals were raised according to their expectations of humane treatment. So the standards of Mountaineer Farms um, is like the typical factory farm standard. So Aldi is sporting this label on their chicken packages. They are the, the I think they were the first, but they're, and I believe the largest grocery store chain to do it. So they understand people under, mm -hmm. care about this stuff, but they slap this kind of label on their product rather than making meaningful changes in their supply chain, because it's a lot easier to put label yeah. um, out there a misleading if, one on their packaging. So if, if I can you know. quote from your article, Jessica, um, According to Brian Ronholm, the director of food policy at Consumer Reports, this OHC One Health certified label is essentially meaningless and should be ignored by consumers. In addition to being confusing and misleading, the label represents the equivalent of a participation trophy for normal factory farming operations. Exactly, exactly. So the question is, I mean, I don't have the answer. Did Aldi know about this ahead of time? Because they know about it now. I mean, one of our partner organizations, Farm Forward, is actively I mean, they they know how people feel about it. Um, they know the facts behind it, but did they know it at the time and it's okay with them? So are they gonna get rid of it? I mean, I don't really have the answer. Um, but there's Brody, by the way, she's playing right here. Oh here? yeah, oh yeah, we, we've seen she, Brody, oh, Brody in this, Brody's been in the screen for a while. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, so why anyway. don't these things change? Why, why is this still going on in your opinion? Um, well, I don't really, um, I'm going to give you my opinion. It's, um, and nothing is based on fact, but knowing how these, the, uh, I, it's probably the, um, profit motivated. I can't imagine any other thing except the profit behind it. So I think it's all, I mean, that's the problem with the animals raised for food. They're commodities. They're not really considered animals. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's all motivated by profit and I mean, confining animals is efficiency to scale. The more animals that you could cram into a small space, the uh, more product that you could turn out for cheaper pork. It's a high price of, high cost of cheap pork, you know? So, you know, and I wish yeah. I had that, uh, that label that we were just talking about, but let's say it again so that people can burn this into their brains if they see this label and know that it's bogus. Yeah. One Health Certified. What? I'm sorry, say it again. One Health Certified. It's a very attractive green label on their on their turkey yeah. chicken brain. And and the label checks off all the all the terms. Animal welfare, veterinary care, biosecurity, environmental impact, and antibiotic restrictions. Yeah, now near That's farms over the past few years, they've been there's a lot of press about it. They've been like um, on the other side of lawsuits with environmental issues, workers' rights. I mean, and this maybe is their way of making peace with the world. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know but uh, you know, it seems that it's very simple that uh, they could uh, go the route of uh, not sourcing 
uh, 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 gestation crates and uh, and make a lot of people happy and uh, not get so much blowback. Well, again, we're not asking Goldie to change its supply chain to more sustainable farmers because undoubtedly that could increase the price and they're very cost efficient. So, I mean, that's another story. I mean, that would be great. And it would be great if they perhaps offered some of their customers that alternative. But again, we're not asking them to change their major factory farm supplier. We're just asking that particular supplier to come to the table and make the same kind of change and giving these mother pigs more space than their competitors have. Waldi is kind of, Waldi is a laggard in this. Their competitors are, are making that commitment and they have not. And you know, one of the ironies of this is on their, on that animal welfare policy on their website, it says they support the principles of animal welfare where animals could exhibit, and I'll, this is in quotes, innate behavior, express innate behaviors. Mm -hmm. So I think if you ask any person, is it innate for an animal to be able to turn around and scratch its butt or something, then, or stretch its legs, I mean, that's innate behavior. It's innate for an animal to be able to walk. So they don't even live up to their own website policy. Is it... <sighs> It must be frustrating for you. Uh, you. You see a lot of bad things going on by different uh, companies, uh, and you have uh, really, as you just uh, uh, alluded to, a, a, a particularly narrow focus. I suppose in one way that, that, that helps you get your mission accomplished because you focus on that one thing, but you ha it's hard not to be distracted by everything else going on out there. Do you mean in the... Um, the gestation crates. Be well... Oh. No, I mean, no, I know, and it is very hard. It is, it is hard because we have a campaign um, with Costco's gestation crate policy, which is, you know, Costco is one chain that has committed to getting rid of gestation crates um, by 2022, but their suppliers, which is a very common practice, still keep the pigs locked up in gestation crates for the first six weeks. So they made that commitment, but there's, a, there's some fine tuning in that. So, I mean, so there is that other campaign and um, we're just getting ready to update and re-release our mobile app, um, helping people find local farmers. We've been involved somewhat with New Jersey has an attempt going on, right? New Jersey is very close to passing legislation to become the next state to ban factory, ban gestation crates. So there's, so there's other things that I do try very hard to stay focused on, but, but all the is particularly perplexing um and hopefully that will change and one thing i started to mention i mean you always have to you always have to hold out that that organizations will eventually do the right thing because i because those organizations are made up of people and it's hard for me to accept the fact that there's people in all these that don't think it's that that i find it hard to believe that the people behind aldi feel that this is a, a good practice, that these animals, that the animals they profit from should live this way. I just yeah. find that hard to accept. Um, but one thing I do want to say before our time runs out is that one thing that could um, be kind of a day of reckoning for a lot of retailers, including Aldi, is that um, January 1st, 2022, Prop 12 in California um, comes into effect. Um, Aldi is expanding rapidly into California. I don't remember how many stores they're planning so, but it is part of their um, overall business strategy. They've op I, again, they've opened up a lot of stores in California, but starting January 1st, it will not only be illegal to use gestation crates in the state of California, but it would be, it's illegal to sell pork in stores or anywhere in California that comes from production facilities that still use gestation crates. So that means that the, after, that for that after January 1st, 2022, that pork sold in any store that comes from a supplier that uses gestation crates would be technically illegal. So I, there's a lot going on in California right now that um, the pork council is trying to get this overturned. It's um, it's being it, it's sticking though. The law is sticking, yeah. and so far no attempt yet to overturn it has been successful. So that could be kind of a a day of reckoning. I mean, maybe Aldi is waiting to see what happens with Prop 12. So. Yeah, well, that um, it sounds like a game changer to me. I mean, when you're talking about California, um, uh, real quickly, also, uh, what? Sorry, the largest market in the world. 
Yeah. So uh, before we go, I want to give you a chance to plug your app. Um, uh, so uh, go for it. Yes. Okay. Well, like I said, uh, I'd like to be on your show, Mike, when, next month when we re-release it. Um, right now, you can find the app. Um, it will still be Crate Free Illinois. That's going to be one of the changes we're going to do. Ah, um, I see. Okay. But it's uh, available on both stores. If you go to our website, CrateFreeUSA.org, there's a tab there um, about how to download the app. And right now it has um, over 300 farms, local farmers all around Illinois that pasture raise. And we are we added quite a few farmers markets. I hope Bob gives me his list pretty soon so we can get those to the app. <laughs> and um, we are starting to add some restaurants too. We're just updating what we have there. It's, it's sad that some, uh, quite a few restaurants have closed. We have to remove them from the app but during the pandemic. But, um, but anyway, so we're in the process of we're continuing to update that. We're going to re release it. It's out there now, but we're going to, like I said, re release it next month. And I'll be back on your show, right? To talk. I, I don't think so. Uh, I don't think that's happening again. No, of no, course. We'll just have Brody on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll put okay. Brody right in the camera. Uh, no, the. Uh, you know you're always welcome here, uh, and we want to have uh, follow-ups on on the work you're doing, which is so important. I think I learned from you uh, back in the day, just a few years ago, uh, when I was first learning about your organization, that uh, the state of Illinois doesn't know how many CAFOs it has. Uh, and I think that, that information came from you. I mean, that's just stunning that the Department of Agriculture not only does not know how many factory farms are in the state, it does not want to know. I mean, this is, this is policy. This is important to them, not yeah. to know how many CAFOs there are. I don't know if I learned it for you or from Karen Hudson. Karen Hudson back on, yeah. too. I learned yeah, I learned it from Karen Hudson, and then so we both learned it from Karen because Karen, wonderful organization, um, I, Illinois Citizens for Clean Air and Water and, and SRAP, um, they track CAFOs, and the number that they come up with is so different from the Illinois Department of Agriculture. They don't want to know. Yeah, the, 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 the Illinois Department of Agriculture, at least in that regard, is an embarrassment, and uh, it's it's done on purpose, and, and it, that needs to change. Uh, there needs to be a little bit more transparency, a little bit, a lot more transparency. All right, we're out of time. Uh, Brody, I'm so sorry we didn't get a chance to interview you, but that will happen in the next uh, uh, time. <laughs> Uh, but Jessica Chipkin, CrateFreeUSA.org, that's how you get there. And when you, when the app comes out, let us know, and you'll be back on the show. All right, thanks. Hope to see you guys in person pretty soon. I hope. Boy, boy, I hope so, too. I want to come out and see your horses out there, too. Okay. Anytime, both of you. All right, take care. Uh, uh, thanks. Okay. All right, let's go. Okay, to, we're going to Central Illinois next, and Guy Sternberg, stick around. You can help slow climate change in 2021 by composting. And you don't even need a backyard. By composting communally in multi-unit buildings across Chicagoland, Collective Resource Compost has diverted 7,000 tons of food scraps since 2010. CRC brings you a fresh 5-gallon bucket or a 32-gallon neighbor tote with each pickup. You fill it with organic matter, they swap it out, and get it to a commercial composting operation. Fight climate change. Go to collectiveresource.us. Whether you're a farmer or a backyard gardener, assist your soil in providing key nutrients to your plants with Spectrum Soil Inoculum from Tinyo Biologicals. The beneficial microorganisms in Spectrum break down and release vital nutrients and make them more accessible to your plants. Spectrum works with nature to decompose organic matter into humus, building richer, healthier soil. Spectrum is approved for use on certified organic crops and is OMRI listed. Get Spectrum at blazing-star.com. Oh, hi. I suppose you're wondering what an A-list celebrity like me is doing in a place like this. You must know, I'm saving the world. Oh, hi, Beth. Yep, saving the world again. <laughs> Did you know that 40% of all the food produced in the United States is thrown away? That means everything that went into that food, the pesticides, the water, the land, was all for nothing. Just look at this perfectly good food thrown in the trash. The pizza with extra Cheerios. At these goldfish and Band-Aid tacos. And just look at this perfect trash burger. This pasta dog looks delicious. You don't have to dumpster dive like Ed Begley Jr. to save the planet. Fight food waste by shopping smart and using what you buy before it gets trashed. That's way better. Ooh. 
illegal. Do your part and find out other world-saving tips at betterthaned.org. <laughs> I know that's uh, nutty, but dumpster uh, diving with Ed. Dumb to, uh, you know, let's let's go do that on a Sunday afternoon when it's ninety something degrees. Hey, look who's ooh, with ooh, us! Ooh. Yeah, boy, oh boy, I can <laughs> <laughs> lip smacking good. Uh, <laughs> Guy Sternberg, how the heck are you? Oh wait, do I have? Well, it has been a long time, hasn't it? Yeah, uh -oh, you know, I, I've got a problem here. I don't have a backers. I don't have a backup singer, and I hope Peggy can just kind of fill in for Brody on the on our segment. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, we, no Brody's down there, but you've got trees. You know, Guy Sternberg uh, is an arborist. He's. Oh wait a second. Let me grab this because I got it here. I don't know if you saw earlier, mm. but. I had a copy of this wonderful book, Native Trees for North American Landscapes by Guy Sternberg and Jim Wilson, with Jim Wilson. Um, boy, it, that was 17 years ago now, Guy. Wow. Um, it's, uh, it made their best sell list initially, and then they sold so many copies, and everybody who wanted one bought one, I guess. So now it's, it's out of print. I'm coming up with it. Timber press? One. It should be right yeah, tim home. timber. Well, he says it's out of yeah, print, but. Press, yeah, I'm, you I'm, can I'm, pick them up used on some of the uh, online used. Yeah. Yeah, they're still out there. We're, we're, we're totally redoing it and updating it and everything. And I'm going to be. Uh, oh, what happened? There we go. Uh, I'm going to be <laughs> yeah. coming out with a new version here by, by fall. So we'll have to get you one. Wow. Right? Oh, really? So are you, are you going to update it? Oh, yeah. Totally. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. And, and, well, by we'll the way, we'll have to get you scheduled for that too. Um, let me apologize okay. to everybody here because uh, we we are you know this is not uh, this is not the big city. Uh, this is uh, Menard County and Petersburg, uh, Illinois, uh, where we're talking to Guy. And as you can see, he freezes from time to time. And we experimented the other day. His computer was no better, and actually, it was worse. Um, so we decided let's connect to the cell tower um, and get that signal because that's that's uh, and as long as we're getting audio we're good. Uh, it's really um, not about uh, although and especially the audio because uh, guy you have the lowest voice in uh, arbor culture um, and you should have been the radio guy and I should have been uh, dumpster diving or or something else. Uh, but um, so, I don't think and, and, and for our listeners, where is Petersburg, Illinois? Well, Petersburg is near Springfield. It's sort of in the okay. middle of the state. Um, yeah. Okay. Sort of in. The, and if you know Illinois, Illinois is a it's a three hundred plus uh, mile long state from top to bottom. So uh, that's what, what, how do you know how many miles that is exactly? Though I have never. Uh, I'm not quite sure. No. Uh, well, it's over 400 from Rockford to Carroll. I'm sorry. Get really? that again. I say it's over 400 from Rockford to Carroll. I'm about halfway down. Okay. Well, then that yeah. great. 400 miles. So you're like Springfield Champaign level in the state. Right. And and what you sh folks should know um, before we get to talking about green ash trees is that Guy Sternberg is the only person I know who planted his own arboretum. Uh, and I've been down there to see it, and it's quite remarkable. Um, it is, you know, all laid out with the grid, uh, which you did a lot of by hand, right, Guy? Uh, yeah, that was back in the day when we didn't have GPS, cell phones, electricity sometimes. Uh, so, yeah, it's not just been me. It's been Edie and me and a lot of volunteer help, and now we have student interns every summer who come. So it's 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 turned into a book. A pretty big deal now. Uh, yeah, um, and uh, and I and I'm and I apologize for not mentioning Edie because she is your partner in this, and the two of you uh, established uh, this arboretum um, on uh, how many acres? You got about twenty acres. Uh, it's it's fifty. Fifty acres. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, um, expanded a couple of times easily. <laughs> and it's already um, it's uh, when you guys move on it's it's going to uh, one of the colleges down there right right yeah it's in trust to Illinois College now and actually it's the college's arboretum and they have classes and courses out here and, and bring students forth 
Uh, uh, we're, I, we're moving out. Yeah, I hope they're they're not out there saying, "Hey, a hey, guy, get out of here. We'll, we'll we'll handle this, okay?" But I think you still probably have a lot to do in the in the arboretum. Um, all right, so you wrote to me the other week, and I was uh, pretty intrigued by it because you were talking, you, you were pleading with me for some help uh, to get some money, to get some cash, uh, so that you could save some blue ash trees. Uh, down in your neck of the woods. We're going to show some photos in a second. Um, tell us about the project and, and why you started it. Well, the ash is a pretty rare species in Illinois. Uh, we have a lot of white ash and green ash out north. You have black ash. There aren't many blue ash. We see a lot in Kentucky and places like that. Uh, they tend to prefer uh, uh, and you find groves of spots. The best of anywhere is on Elkhart Hill, which is in Logan County, Illinois, just a little bit northeast of me. And there are there's a 62-acre track there on top of the hill that's indicated as nature preserve because of the blue ash component there. The old grays, I'm sure, or we don't know exactly how we're going to try to call one eventually. Uh, but when the emerald ash borer came coming through, of course, the white ash should die and the green green ash are dying, black, everything, but blue ash does have some resistance to it. Now, that's not the say blue ash are dying, but not all of them are. And I yeah. went there and ate how many were left, and surprisingly, a lot of them were left. So we thought, well, let's try to raise some money, do a one touch on the arm for the tree, and try to get them through the crest of normal ash borer. Once the ash borer starts to decline, when all the other ash trees are dead, these trees, we think, and hope, can make it on their own without further intervention but of course it's the money to treat the big old ash to trying to, to raise donations well how much does it cost to treat uh one ash tree one blue ash tree well we're figuring with ten dollars per diameter so if you have a 20 inch diameter tree it's 200 dollars. 40 inch diameter tree we do have some of those and bigger that's 400 so the, the project that we have currently in the nature preserve is 32 trees uh that's about $12,000 worth of, of treatments, and we've just about raised that amount of money already. We're, we're about ready to go. We'll also be treating additional a... 30 trees in other areas, and, land. and those aren't part of this project, but we're going to have the same people. Yeah. So well, this is a systemic treatment of the blue ash at this reserve? Right. We're specifically uh, targeting the nature preserve because it is a protected Illinois site. Uh, we need to get permits for it. We need to have all kinds of hoops to jump through. Well, when people see that this has been dedicated because of these rare trees there, they tend to get on board. And when yeah. I see I see by far the biggest, the best blue ash forest I've ever seen. And we can't just let this go. I, I went out there uh, six weeks ago just to look at the bluebell, annual bluebell, and I thought, well, let's see if there's any ash tree left. Well, most of them are still alive. So that's yeah. when you say, hey, we have to jump on this, the treatment time is is basically now and a week from now we'll be starting so we had to raise the money get the permissions and, and do all the measurements and everything uh, quick and we mm -hmm. went out there we looked for all the ash trees we to find trees that were exposed to the sun that had a full canopy that were in good shape that were both male trees and female trees because they're not both and we've measured that we were going to treat we photographed it we've gps it we've flagged it we have it on a map. We have an actual application manual to take out the readers. We can do every tree. Uh, it's it's been a lot of work, and I hope it'll be a, a really great result that we can share with people nationwide. Uh, I'm going to yeah. tell I'm going to tell you right now, just to, to interject this the, the signal we tested it like two or three times. This is the worst it's been. So we're but yeah. we're dealing with it. Um, yeah. yeah. And so that's, I'm trying to summarize a little too. So you've <laughs> you have a. Um, a company or an applicator coming out that you're working with, that you're paying to, with these funds, to treat the trees, to treat the blue ash at the preserve. That's true. Uh, there, there aren't many companies here that do that. You have more in Chicago who are very qualified, I think, including one of your sponsors. But uh, down here, we, we're limited. So we are getting, actually getting the manufacturer representative to come down from Wisconsin to do these treatments, and he's pretty much at cost because he knows that we're doing something very special. He wants to participate in it. It's just, to the extent he can without losing money, he's going to do it. Well, speaking of uh, our sponsor, Bartlett Tree Experts, uh, because every tree needs a champion, um, 
Uh, Scott Jameson, who's who's watching, uh, has a message for you, Guy, and it's Boiler Up. <laughs> Hi, buddy. <laughs> Long he said time. his fellow Purdue buddy, yes. Yeah, that's Purdue. Uh, and so uh, um, uh, we were talking the other day, Guy, about the treatment, and you said that obviously the folks at Bartlett would know about this kind of treatment for blue ash. Are, are there enough blue ash in the Chicago area to make it worthwhile? Uh, there surely are some. Uh, I know of little patches in Michigan and elsewhere, but they are very scattered and generally only find them where you have these little alkaline outcrops of soil. Uh, if you have one that's planted in your yards, you know, take care of it. If you find in you know, a forest preserve someplace that there are a few in, in some alkaline soil, most of what you see up there are going to be white ash, green ash, and some black ash. And right. We, they, I, they I can just, be saved, but you yeah. treat them all the time. Yeah, yeah you going. just ha you have to you go at it. And we talked the other day because I thought that there might be a blue ash in my block, and you looked at the, the bark that I sent you and said, yeah, it's probably a green ash. Uh, but those, I got two ash trees on the on the block right now that that are in really great shape, and you suspect somebody's treating them, and it's quite possible. Maybe I should ask uh, Scott about that, whether the because I didn't know that the city was doing that on their own. I thought, and because I, I know the the my neighbor's not treating that tree, and and the other neighbor just moved in, and they know nothing about it. So if they're being treated, it's being done. By somebody else, um, I have uh, no idea. The treatment could have been done two or three years ago, and that set the boars back. Now they may be in there again, but it takes several years for boars to to tack to the point where the tree actually shows symptoms. So yeah, you can get in there and see those now. You know, ask Scott to do, give them an injection and, and see what happens. So, what is the uh, the uh, treatment that you guys use? Uh, and, and you're saying it's different from other emerald ash borer treatments. Uh, well, there are several things you can small. Uh, the most effective, the only effective thing on trees that are over, say, 20 to 24 inches in diameter is emamectin benzo weight. And there are a couple of different formulations that I know are being used. We're using mectinite, which is a, a new product that does not require the insertion of the rubber dams that some of the other products do, but they all have the same chemical. They all work the same way. Mm -hmm. And the, the advantage of this is that it's a two to three year application the bores that are in the tree and protect the tree the next year from the bores start to come back the next year following year and you start over again with white ash and green ash and so forth blue ash we're hoping it's a one and done and i've been talking in kentucky where blue ash is much more common and also when the ash borer got a head start and so people would go camping and they bring infected wood from chicago mm -hmm. down to kentucky to go camping and they got it going in there and they're finding blue ash trees that were in good condition, exposed to the sun, fertile soil, you know, all things go before the boar came. 40% of those are still alive when the boar has gone through its cycle. So what we're trying to do here is get our trees to join that 40% group, just get them over the, the cusp of, of the, or the boar population, and then we'll see what happens. And all right. I need to I, go I, back one more time. I might try to use more money, but after that, it's they're on their own. So for for what what did you say? Around fourteen, fifteen thousand dollars right now. You think you can get most of the trees in the area? And there's some spectacular ones here. Uh, but again, I want to yeah. because you've been breaking up uh, a little bit. Uh, let people know. So the idea is you treat them with this uh, product. Um, the blue ash has more. Uh, resistance emerald ash borer, and you think one treatment is going to last four or five years, maybe there will be a follow-up treatment, and then they'll make it through once the emerald ash borer moves on and the population crashes, whereas the green ash and the white ash, they have to be treated more regularly. I have a friend uh, that I mentioned to you um, who's got a, a magnificent ash tree, and I don't know whether it's a green ash or a white ash in his backyard, and I yeah. went to visit him, and he said, is it worth the treatment? We're paying about 700 bucks every other year. And I said, absolutely. Are you kidding me? Look at this magnificent tree. Uh, you're, you know, so it turns out, what, you're paying 350 to $400 a year to keep this incredibly beautiful tree alive? Yeah, it's worth it right now. So, Definitely. so yeah, Tell him also to compare the cost of having the tree removed out of his backyard. And then what's left is a no, no tree. Right. And if he can keep that tree for that amount of money, keep it going indefinitely, mm -hmm. you know, definitely it's worth it. Now, if the tree is in bad shape, yeah. if it's in a bad location, you know, no. But if you have a great tree, that that's going to be selective and do triage more or less and pick the best trees and save them. 
yeah. in our in our case, we we really are hoping that this is a one and done treatment. If necessary, and if we have enough funds, we might have to go back and do a second treatment in say three or four years. We're hoping by then it won't even be needed. Uh, I'm I would bet two large pieces that we don't have to go back a second time. And you know that's a big bet for me. <laughs> yeah. So, right. so guy, do do we know why the blue ash seems to be more resistant than other? Uh, well, other yeah, ashes? we do know that it's close, it's closely related to Manchurian ash, and very distantly related to all the other native ash that we have. And Manchurian ash, whether it's through evolution with the borer or whatever, that tends to be resistant to the borer. And blue ash is showing some of those same signs. So, some something do with the trees coming with the tree. I don't know what it is. But it's a different tree. It's 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 an apple and orchard of pears, more. Or less. So when if you can treat it once to get it through this this unusually high population, and then if the predatory wasps and think that they're already beginning to get ready to release, the prey on the borers can come in, and if the trees mm -hmm. themselves can be healthy to start with, we're we are eighty percent sure that this is going to be the one treatment that'll save most of these trees. Yeah. All right. Let's uh, let's pop in a, a photo here. As I wrote, uh, I put I put this on the blog post. This is uh, Guy Sternberg and friends, and this is um, you. It's hard, a little hard to see, but um, you can see Guy. Uh, those are magnificent trees. I mean, for for Central Illinois, I, I see. I've been to the West Coast and and had a house among two hundred and fifty foot tall and three hundred tall foot tall. Uh, uh, Western hemlocks and Sitka sand, or Sitka spruces, and um, this, the, but these trees are pretty magnificent, and you can see the bluebells in bloom there. So when were you out there? Uh, this would have been taken in uh, late April. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. there are sixty some acres, just solid brown cover of bluebells. Those trees are average to just slightly above average in size of what we're going to be treating. Those are, are 32 to 36 inches in diameter. We do have some more than 40 inches that we're going to be treating. And they so are how old would these trees be? The, background. Uh, the age is speculative. I have a chance to core any of them or, or count rings. But based upon seeing them, seeing what little they've grown that time, I can just count the trees that are that size. And they're certainly pre-Civil War. And they may be pre-American Revolution. We have to go back and look. Wow. Whatever they are, they are 120 to 140 feet tall. They're just, you know, they're majestic trees. And the whole forest is blue ash with an understory of sugar maple and a few other things. And then a ground story of, of the bluebells that you see there. Oh, and it looks remarkable. Uh, and now uh, we've got some fo uh, photos here of the folks that you've uh, helped uh, with the treatment for their trees, right? Right, yeah. These are the cons. They live on the Elkhorn Hill just adjacent to the neighborhood. This is the biggest of three trees on their property that they're going to treat with their own funds, but we're going to have the same company do it for them. Uh, the money is strictly for the neighborhood else, and I've encouraged neighbors around the hill to treat their trees, and there are four of them, northeast, south, and west, basically surrounding it, that will do so. Uh, this is the cons. They are treating three trees. Uh, we have other people, who are, one's doing three, one's doing one, one's doing eight. Uh, so we have another 15 trees that immediately surround the nature preserve that can shed seeds and pollen into the preserve and help to restore any trees that do die there. So it's a win-win for everybody. Uh, uh, two things. One is uh, uh, Scott just uh, uh, sent us a message. The injection for EAB is nearly 100% effective, and I assume he's talking about whatever product they're using. You're, I mean, we've mentioned several uh, products here. Um, and maybe you can clarify that uh, a little bit, Scott. But I want you to guys look at the bark on the right there, or, or I'm sorry, on the tree that's showing up, because I, I can see the next one in preview on the left. But look at the bark on the tree that's there now, and I'm going to show you this bark, and it looks very different, but that's the same species? Is this what you're telling me, Guy? Yeah. They, they vary a lot, and None of them look like white ash or green ash bark. They all look almost like, like oak bark or something. Uh, mm -hmm. This Hudson, he owned, this is the one who owns one tree on the south side of the preserve, and this tree is within about 40 feet of the boundary of the nature preserve. So he's going to pay to have this one treated as well. And so this, this tree, is, I'm guessing, is, is more ahead. open grown. It's probably more like 100 or 110 feet tall, but it's still a tremendous tree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, this preserve, uh, what's the name of it again? It's the Elkhart Hill Grove. And, and is this a private? That's in, 
uh, is privately owned, but the owners have dedicated it to the states, and it's now legally protected. Yeah. Okay. And that's in Logan County, right? Correct. It's the highest point in central Illinois. It's an elevation at the middle is 720 feet, and every, everybody around that, like where I am, is about 600. So it's, it's, it's a conspicuous glacial relic that the glaciers missed or, or something happened to algae, but the soil of that is uniquely alkaline, and these trees are just thriving in it. And there are a couple other places that we're going to be working with as well. Now, one I'll mention is Lake Springfield and, and uh, Springfield. We're doing 12 trees there with the city okay. paying for it. And that's, again, a little knoll, so that's where they like to grow. Yeah. Well, uh, would you say that again? Lake, because Lake Springfield. Oh, how did you hear that? It's just like totally b broken up there. I've sailed there. Oh, okay, great. Uh, <laughs> and who are these uh, two people uh, on the right of this tree? Uh, well, well, you've got one of them in the red coat is Mona Ma. She's been on our, our right hand since she lives there. Uh, she's keeping all the records for us. She took me in at the preserve and said, let's go look at the trees. And I thought, well, we're going to see a lot of dead trees. Wow. And lo and behold, most of them are alive. And Sarah Lindholm is next to her. She is the one who is, of course, she's the biologist who works for Springfield. will be coordinating that other treatment. We're working together on it. Yeah. Uh, she's uh, magnificent. Wow. Uh, here's, this is fun. Uh, the tree <laughs> with a face. Uh, and you have one of these at, uh, yeah. at uh, Spring Hill uh, uh, um, Arboretum. Well, so. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, the, this is actually Mona again with her husband, Vern. This is in their backyard. That picture was taken from their porch. Looking at the tree in their backyard, they put the face on it. Of course, it's harmless. This is another blue ash. She's treating three well with, with again, with her own funds. Yeah. Uh, let's pop this up. Uh, and this, you you guys measuring this tree? Yeah, we are measuring and, and flagging it. When, when we find the tree that we find is acceptable in terms of it has a good root flare, it's got access to the sun, it's in, uh, we have flagged it with a white, white ribbon. Well, we actually measured diameter with the diameter it converts automatically. Uh, and this is one of my intern Baker on the left, and I'm with Sarah on the right. And this is just one of, of 32 trees in the nature preserve that we're going to be treating. Yeah, and mm -hmm. here's here's one more that uh, you're working on. Yeah. You know, what I ask is, how can you not try to save something like this? Yeah. You, know, who, who, you have who to. You say, well, leave it to its own devices. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. You, you have look, to. There's another tree in the back of the that also has the, the slagging closely the tree there and, and just behind it. Yeah. So we're taking groups of trees. We're leaving a few here and there that either have issues or too far off or whatever, and we're leaving those as, to see what the difference is between the trees that we do treat. And like Scott says, this is a, if you do it right in the right time, it's 100% effective. There's no question. But the um, ones that we don't treat on their own, see how they pull through, retain bigger if they if they stay alive. Um, yeah. Uh, I will tell in a couple of years. Yeah, um, something you taught taught me the other day. Uh, uh, Skeet is telling us uh, in a message: uh, quadrilangulata, square branches with ridges, um, and uh, that's how you identify a blue ash: is that the, the branches are are square. Right, and and the the vigorous branches are square. A low branch on an old tree is going to not really show that. But when you have a sucker or a young tree or a branch from high in the crown then going up, they're absolutely square. They're four-winged, almost like you want them us. Uh, mm -hmm. So there's no doubt that those are. And the leaves are different because different. You know, the seeds are different. But the quick, easy, sure way to tell is by this square branch. That's the same quadrangular laid as you know, four angles. Right. All right. Well, uh, I'm going to let you go. I'm uh, I'm a little frustrated that our, our audio wasn't better. Next time, I'm going to have you drive out to a McDonald's and sit in the parking lot um, because that's... Next, next time, we're going to get you down and, and go in the woods, and we'll do it there. All right. Sounds we good. are. Now that we can actually go places, I would love... I, this is actually out on my back porch here. It's kind of a practice for going on uh, location uh, somewhere and seeing if we can do the show that way, and I'm very excited about uh, the possibility. Possibility. So uh, now you say you have most of the cash you need, but if folks want to contribute to this, uh, and if they do, will you find more trees to treat? 
Uh, we will find a couple more. I think the big thing is we can we cannot have the champions in the that we're reluctant if we can find people who are willing to jump in. Uh, also, if we do have extra, I can either refund that or if we're willing to put that, have you put it in the bank for a possible follow up, that would be as well. Uh, so know, if this, they want to give you a yeah, so if you want to do that, you can go to my website and uh, you would you would write a check to the Illinois Native Plant Society, and in the memo line you write Ash Cash, which uh, just that gets a ding. Uh, I love the idea of Ash Cash, and then you send the check to Guy Sternberg, Star Hill Forest Arboretum, twelve thousand Boy Scout Trail, Petersburg, Illinois six two six seven five. But of course. You can uh, go to my website and find that guy. I'm going to let you go because uh, 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 this is just too good, and we will um, get you back on the show when we have a better connection. Um, and, uh, and also when the new book comes out. And when the new book comes out, so yeah. we're we're absolutely well, we'll have a better connection by far. But you know, we're still working. We're like, we're on the country here. You know? <laughs> no kidding. Well, you know, maybe uh, with the new infrastructure uh, bill, you will get some real internet connection there so i hope maybe something like that happens i'll, I'll take a bet on that too but we'll see uh, okay thank you both interest in all this and and it's great and seeing a great guy i got to see you in person and my my best to Edie. okay will do thank you very much all right take, take care, care folks bye-bye thanks guy uh bye -bye. and there we go before we get out of here i gotta make sure his mic gets turned off so uh there we go uh, I wanted to pop up a couple of things. Oh, we're all actually over time. Real quick. Real, real, no, real. Okay. Uh, uh, you know, because I found, uh, um, you'll find this interesting. This is, uh, because I was watching a program yesterday. Uh, we don't have Rick DeMaio today, but uh, something he would be interested in. Look at this. This is the U.S. Drought Monitor map from June 2nd of last year. That's last year. All right. Now. Here's the map. It's not exactly the same size, but uh, but look at the red areas in particular, okay? Here's the map from and this. And look at Illinois, too. Well, yeah, look at Illinois. No uh, no drought at all. Zero. zippity doo -da. Um, Here's this year's map. Look at all the red. And, and, I, and I'll go back again so you can see the difference. I wish they were exactly the same size, but they're not. But look at all the red, especially in the uh, north... Dakota, uh, stretching into South Dakota, and of course, the the Southwest California is just is Southwest. just a mess there. But here's here's last year, here's this year, unbelievable. Fire seasons barely even started. Yeah, here's us from uh, this is May twentieth uh, of this year. All right, uh, and you can see that little area that's right around Chicago that has uh, a severe drought. Uh, Lake County. And, and then I put in uh, from June 3rd, this is June 3rd, it really hasn't changed much. If you look at the two maps, where it has changed, and I'll pop the other one back up. If you look at the other map, you've got uh, less drought in Minnesota here, and the drought in southern Illinois, uh, you'll see, uh, has shifted now to uh, yeah. Indiana, and there's some in Kentucky and uh, Ohio. But we still and southeast have, Wisconsin's gotten much worse. Yeah, uh, well, not a lot. It's actually uh, it's a little well, it's bit. It's gone worse. from moderate to severe. Right. Yeah, it has. There's some of that. So I just thought that um, I would uh, show those maps because uh, they're very indicative of what we're dealing with. And with more hot weather and dry weather on the way, uh, we really need to uh, uh, be careful out there folks and hope we get some rain so I guess we can start this you know and this whole thing was just an experiment and there was no reason that this should have worked okay that's all I got to say uh, <laughs> on the back porch I want to thank everybody uh, on the show today uh, Bob Benenson and Jessica Chipkin from Crate Free USA and Brody and Brody of course too and and um, Guy, uh, I almost said McPherson, but no, uh, it's Guy Sternberg um, from Star Hill Forest Arboretum. Thanks to Kathleen. Thanks to Lagata. Uh, thanks to Basil. Until next time, go green or go home. Uh, Stadler? Uh, what? Is that it? Yes, it's over. How'd you like it? 
I don't know. I slept through the whole thing. Well, you didn't miss much. Thank <laughs> you.